very much for the invitation. It's a great honor to be here to talk about uh, transformative social innovation from a power perspective. These are a lot of big words. And before we go into explaining what we mean by them and how we research them, um, it's important to explain why we study this in the first place. Why, why is this a relevant topic? And also from which place are we looking at these themes? Uh, how are we positioned uh, in, in the social science um, context? Um, so to start with the question of why, it's important to recognize that the societal challenges that we're looking at, whether they're economic, social, uh, or ecological, whether we're talking about climate change or floods or droughts or geopolitical tensions, wars, poverty, um, racism, all these societal challenges that we're facing today, today they're persistent. Uh, so they have been around for many decades uh, and they are very intimately interconnected. So you cannot solve one without also looking at the other. Um, and I think the most important starting point in transition research is that in order to tackle these challenges, innovation is not enough. Technological innovation is not enough, but social innovation is also not enough. We need transformative systemic change or what we in transition research call transitions towards more just and sustainable societies. And in order to um, address uh, and understand these big societal challenges and the ways in which we can deal with them, we need many different disciplinary insights, not only social science, but also um, all sorts of other um, fields of research and within social science in the rich diversity of different perspectives. Um, so this brings us to the concept of transformative social innovation, which I see as sitting at the intersection between different fields of research. And I here I will highlight the four fields of research that, that I work with most. First, of course, uh, social innovation research, uh, sustainability transitions, but also um, studies on social and solidarity economy and social movement research. And I would definitely not claim that I'm an expert in, in all of these fields, but I increasingly find myself collaborating with uh, research, researchers and, and, and experts from these different fields of research and practice also, um, because we share an interest in understanding how innovation or not just innovation, but also alternatives um, and social movements, how these, these alternative initiatives are contributing to transformative social change and to understand the relation between one and the other. Um, and we are doing this across many different uh, projects. I've been working on this for the past 15 years at uh, DRIFT at the Erasmus University of Rotterdam, but collaborating with many other research institutes uh, in, in various international research projects. Uh, some of them, like transit uh, on transformative social innovation, are about this, this topic in a general sense and at a theoretical level. But some of these projects also look specifically at uh, the energy transitions and, and at how social innovation manifests in sustainable and just cities. I will say a bit more about the transit project, but I won't go into the details of these other projects, but you can find all information online and I'm happy to provide more information and documents for those who want. Um, so what I will be doing in this webinar um, is, uh, first of all, obviously introduce what we mean by transformative social innovation, theoretically, conceptually, but also empirically, give some examples. Uh, what is the role of power and power dynamics in transformative social innovation? And specifically, what can we learn from taking a multi-actor perspective on understanding how power relations are shifting in processes of innovation? And last but not least, I would like to end with some reflections on the politics of it all. Uh, I have a lot of different slides and I will go quite fast. Um, this meeting is uh, recorded. So there will be a recording of, of the webinar. But for those of you who want to look back at the slides, I will also be sharing um, the PDF of the slides on social media. So you feel free to download it and, and look back. at. Okay, so let's uh, dive right into it. Uh, social innovation. Uh, we define it in a very broad sense as a set of ideas, objects, and or activities that involve 
changing social relations, involving new ways of doing, new ways of thinking, and new ways of organizing. Um, so the best way to explain this is through an example. So if we take the example of community energy, so uh, decentralized energy production, uh, production, obviously there is a very important technological component in here. Um, obviously without the windmills and the social panel, panels, there would be no decentralized energy production. Um, but we argue it's also socially innovative in the sense that it also leads to new relations between consumers and producers, between neighbors, between citizens and governments. And it comes with all sorts of new practices, uh, like going to the roof with your neighbors to attend to your solar panels. Uh, it also comes with new ways of thinking and talking about energy, such as the word or even entirely new words like the prosumer as a combination of consumer and producer. And it comes with new forms of organizing, such as using the cooperative form to organize uh, community energy. Um, and here, it's not necessarily about um, uh, inventing the uh, cooperative, but rather about reinventing it. Because um, it's important to remember, not just with social innovation, but with innovation more generally, that um, when, when we look at the example of cooperatives, there is, as we all know, there's nothing new about the cooperative. It has been, it has existed for many centuries. But what you do see is that in past years, there has been a renewed interest, a reinvention of the cooperative, partly in response to the economic crisis of 2008. So innovation is not necessarily about entirely new things. It can also be about reinventing things from the past or, or new combinations of old things. Another thing that is important to emphasize is that we, when we talk about social innovation and energy, we often use community energy as an illustration, but it's not the only form of social innovation. It, there are many other types of social innovation in energy, such as platforms for energy uh, transactions, uh, trends around gamification and nudging, uh, local. So there is many different types of social innovation, as, um, and I can really recommend the the work by my colleague Julia Wittmeyer and other researchers in the, in the SONET project that, that are mapping this diversity of, of energy, of social innovation in energy. Um, so we are interested to understand how innovation can be transformative. And we have argued that uh, social innovation is transformative to the extent that it challenges, alters and or replaces the dominant structures and institutions in the social context. So if we go back to the example of community energy, this is transformative to the extent that it's, I mean, obviously it's socially innovative and it's technologically innovative, but it's transformative to the extent that it challenges, alters, and or replaces the, the kind of broader energy system that is centralized, fossil fuel based and utterly polluting. And more fundamentally, also the underlying economic system of capitalism and extractivism and unbridled uh, growth. Um, and then, so of course, the big research question is how can and how does, uh, to what extent, how and under which conditions does social innovation contribute to such transformative change? So this was the central research question in our transit project on transformative social innovation theory, where we collaborated with um, many different researchers across Europe and Latin America. Um, and one of the main aims, as the, the title of the project also suggests, was to develop a theory about transformative social innovation. And we did so building on many different uh, theoretical and, and, and epistemological traditions, raising from institutional theory and relational theory to innovation studies, political theory, social psychology, which led to endless debates over four years, as you can imagine. Um, and um, I'm not going to go into the details of all those discussions, um, but I think a good impression of how the theory has developed over the, the years is given in, in first, this was the one of the first uh, articles we wrote about transformative social innovation. We wrote it in 2014, submitted in 2015, then it was online, and then it was finally published published in 2019. I think many of you can recognize this long-term process. So I'm very happy to now be able to announce that kind of the final product of the transit project was finally published uh, two months ago, I think, just before summer um, in research policy, where we really kind of present the, the middle range theory on transformative social. 
So to give you a bit of a more of an impression of what's in that article, basically we look at social innovation by looking at the following units of analysis. We look at the social innovation initiatives, as well as the networks, as well as the members in those initiatives and networks, the institutions uh, in, the context, in the social context, as well as the social material context itself. And then uh, basically we, we formulated theoretical propositions um, around these different levels of relations. Uh, so we have 12 propositions for each of these relations. So I'm not going to go into each of them one by one, but you get a good impression um, in, in, in the rest of the presentation. So besides of all the theories that we build on, um, it, this was matched by a very ambitious empirical project where we looked at 20 networks, 20 social movements that are working on social innovation and that have transformative ambitions. Um, and we studied these as international network organizations. But we also zoomed in on how these movements manifest at local, regional and national initiatives. So we looked at 100 initiatives across 27 countries. And you can find all the case study reports on our website. I don't have time to discuss all of them, but I'll give three examples. So the first example is participatory budgeting. To summarize it very rather simplistically, it's the, uh, the process by which uh, citizens are involved in deciding how government budgets are being spent, mostly municipal budgets. So it's a form of direct democracy and economic democracy. Uh, it started in the 80s in Porto Alegre in Brazil, and then it spread across the world. In 2012, Sintomer et al estimated that there were between 800 and 1500 participatory budgeting initiatives across the world and since then it has continued to grow. Uh, another example is the Impact Hub, which is um, a network of social entrepreneurs who are not only sharing working spaces, which they call the Impact Hubs, so it's not only a physical co-working space, but they also share a particular way of working and they collaborate with each other to kind of see how they can combine, you know, entrepreneurship and, and making a living and, and economic uh, success, but do so in a way that really has positive social and ecological impact. Uh, it started, the first impact hub started in London in 2005, and since then it has grown uh, impressively across the world, where we now have more than 100 impact hubs um, across um, the globe with over 1600 members. A completely different example are eco villages. Um, a very simple definition of an eco village is that it's a human skill settlement where people try to live in harmony with each other and with nature. And what eco villages are known for is that they have been pioneers in organic agriculture decades, already way before it was available in our supermarkets. Uh, there are also pioneers in the ecological construction of houses. What you see here is Eco Village Findhorn, where they have turned whiskey barrels into a house, which is, of course, makes for very nice pictures. Uh, but besides all this ecological and technological um, innovation, there is, of course, also a lot of social innovation, including a lot of work on conflict mediation and decision making, because obviously when you live with a small group of people on a small piece of land, uh, formal democracy, you know, 51% says this, so that's what we're going to do, that's not going to work, and full consensus is also not going to work because you don't get anything. So they experiment with a lot of alternative forms of decision making, like, for instance, sociocracy. And other people give entire webinars about sociocracy, and we also wrote a little bit about it in our case study reports. Um, one eco-village that uh, we also studied in the transit project, um, and I personally studied this and visited them, is Tamira eco-village in Portugal. Uh, one of the things they're most known for is for their water retention landscape uh, approach, where they use permaculture uh, techniques to build um, man-made uh, lakes, but in a way that is uh, ecologically benign. Uh, and here you see a picture of how they kind of transformed this very dry area in, in the south of Portugal in Alentejo and, and it kind of transformed it into a very green and lush uh, area and, and experts from around the world visit Tamira to learn about how they, how they have done this. Other things they're known for, like many other ecovillages, are is organic agriculture. Uh, they built the first straw bill house in Portugal. 
and they experiment a lot with low-tech innovation. So for instance, on the left bottom, you see the solar cooker, the, the lady that you see on the right bottom, and for the interview, she made me a cup of coffee on, her, on their solar uh, cooker. And, and another thing Tamira is very known for is for also then very much emphasizing the role that community plays in changing social relations. Uh, between people and also the spiritual connections between people uh, and nature. I could talk for hours about this case study, I'm not going to. Uh, there are thousands of eco-villages uh, across the world and they are organized amongst others in the Global Eco-Village Network, which has different departments on each continent. And then there is also national and local um, departments of, of those. And not only are they organized as eco-villages, um, but they also really try to make a big effort to spread their insights and to kind of connect to many other grassroots uh, and social innovation initiatives. So for instance, they have the solution library where they collect an, an open source uh, collection of, of, of insights and tools. They do a lot of education and, and, and capacity building around the world. So not just for people living in eco-villages, but very much also for, uh, for other people who want to learn from or just experience what it's like to be in an eco-village. Uh, they have been organizing online events for many years already, way before Corona forced all of us to be online all the time. They were actually quite far ahead with using these methods, which I always find quite amusing because people often have this prejudice of eco-villages being hippies that want to go back to the past and kind of, you know, not take, uh, shy away from technology. And the irony is that actually when it comes to using these modern technologies to communicate with each other, they were actually quite far ahead. Um, they, have, they are one of the founding partners of the European Network for Community-Led Initiatives on Climate Change and Sustainability, short ECOLISA. Uh, they founded this together with many other grassroots initiatives like Transition Towns and Permaculture. And they make, with, through ECOLISA, they, they, they make quite some effort to translate um, this idea of sustainability and community to the, you know, the wider public, for instance, by organizing the European Day of Sustainable Communities, uh, collaborating with the European Commission on uh, exploring how citizens and municipalities can better collaborate with one another. And actually this morning, uh, there was the, the launch of the Communities for Future um, Action Program, which is a new action program that is kind of a next level attempt to really connect these community-led um, initiatives to the more political uh, and policy-making uh, process. And so this morning, there was really, there, I think there were 150 people at this online lunch, and it was people living in eco-villages across Europe, but also um, members of European Parliament, uh, people from the European Commission. So it's, it's an interesting strategic collaboration that's going on there. So these were just three examples. There is many more, including digital fabrication wor uh, workshops, um, things like uh, basic income, time banks, um, uh, cooperative housing, uh, and, and many more examples. And it's important to acknowledge that there are many differences across these uh, networks in terms of their priorities, their methods, their approaches, the kind of people that they um, that they involve, but there are also some important commonalities. And one important commonality is this uh, phenomenon of what we call translocal empowerment. Because what is interesting about these initiatives is that on the one hand, they are hyper, hyper local. They're very locally embedded. If you look at an eco-village, but also an impact hub or, you know, a participatory budgeting initiative, it's like very rooted in a very specific locality. But at the same time, they are also regionally, nationally, and even globally connected through all these different networks. And we have argued that it's particularly this combination of the local and the global that is very empowering for the people involved, because on the one hand, they can see the direct effects of what they're doing in their direct local environment, but at the same time, they're also connected to all these people in other places and seeing their impact. So it's a way of growing and scaling and, 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 and gaining power without necessarily each initiative in itself becoming much bigger. So this issue of empowerment also brings us to the issue of uh, power, because it's all very nice to say that you know, these initiatives are being empowered, but to what extent does that then actually change 
existing power relations. And I think um, asking that question is, is very important because when we go to the, the societal challenges that we are facing, um, these challenges come with very problematic power relations of uh, inequality, oppression, exclusion, exploitation, extraction, and injustice. So it becomes a responsibility when we're studying and working on social innovation to ask social innovations actually challenging, but possibly also reproducing these existing problematic power relations. And, and what are the intended power implications of these social innovations, but also the unintended implications. So this is something that we did not focus on the transit project, but uh, we are increasingly working on now and in future projects. Um, and doing so is easier said than done because power is one of the most contested uh, concepts in political and social theory, where we have definitions, so many definitions that sometimes they are even opposite, like, you know, some defining interest, the capacity of A to make B do something against his or her will versus others that have defined power as collective, uh, the, the capacity of systems to reach collective goals. And, and of course, we probably all know this endless straight, uh, structure agency debate in social science, where the big debate is about whether power is something that mostly lies in structures and institutions, or whether it's something that lies mostly with us as individual agents. And there are many more contestations uh, about power, whether it's uh, centralized or diffused, consensual conflicting, constraining or enabling. Uh, and my argument has been that we should not uh, try to uh, choose sides between these different debates and perspectives on powers, but rather learn from all of them to see what kind of questions do we need to ask about social innovation processes. Uh, so, in a forthcoming um, article uh, in the Journal of Political Power, what, what I have done is uh, mapped different power theories and formulated what we can learn from each of these theories for asking empirical questions about social innovation and, and transformative change more generally. I don't have time to go into all of them, uh, but to kind of give this, this abstract topic a bit more um, content, I would like to give two examples. Um, so one big debate is about, and, and here there is some overlap with the previous talk, but I'll, I'll bring it back to the social innovation uh, quite soon. So one big debate is about whether power is consensual or conflictual. And here uh, Michael Mann has argued that violence is the most concentrated and bluntest form of human power, while Hannah Arendt has argued that uh, actually, violence and power are opposites, and that violence is incapable of creating power. So a very good example for this is if I need to put a gun to your head to make you do something, it's actually because I have no power over you. Um, and then to complicate things further, uh, Michel Foucault has argued that actually you don't even need physical violence to be oppressive. And he has this beautiful quote where he argues that you know, subjection is not only obtained by the instruments of violence, um, and it can be direct physical pitting force against force. It doesn't need to involve violence. It may be calculated, organized, technically thought out. It may be subtle. It may make use neither of weapons nor of terror and yet remain a physical work. Now, we can have endless debates about which of these three is uh, has the correct power perspective, but much more interesting, I would say, is to ask how do we see all three of these types of power manifested in uh, the social innovation processes that we look at. So if you go back to the energy system, um, it's very clear to see Foucauldian power at work there, not just in the physical infrastructures that we are all captured by, but also very much the kind of cultural and social lifestyles and the kind of uh, mental expectations that we have about the energy system, which make it incredibly difficult for anything to change within that system, not only physically and materially, but also discursively and mentally. We obviously also see Hannah Arendt's idea of power as the capacity of actors, uh, of humans to act in concert um, as they um, as they come together to produce energy by their, you know, on their own terms and, and, and kind of making new social relations to each other and developing communities. And of course, we very much see uh, also 
power as violence, um, as uh, the energy sector is one of the sectors where we see a lot of geopolitical tensions and wars um, around energy. And what you see here on the bottom of this picture is a woman that just got tear gassed after pro during a protest against the pipelines in North America. And on the left bottom, you see a very interesting movement, which is the tiny house warriors, where indigenous populations are using this kind of very hipster idea of tiny houses, you know, about living in tiny houses, but they're using this movement of tiny houses to kind of occupy the lands where these pipelines are being put to say, you know, we live here. This is, you know, land where people actually, it's inhabited land, we live here. So it's a very interesting example of how social innovation um, can come together with a we not oppose those two uh, things. Uh, so another big discussion is about uh, whether power is centralized or uh, decentralized. And uh, here, again, we can go into the endless debate on the three phases of power, where Dahl has said, no, we need, uh, currently, there, there is no more power that is centralized in the elites. We, we've gone beyond ruling elites because we live in a democracy. And then others pointed out, well, but elites still have the power to set the agenda. Uh, and then Mukes went even a step further that there is even the power of preference shaping. So if, even if people think they have free choice, they're actually, but their preferences are being shaped. And again, uh, rather than discussing which of these three phases of power is correct, it's about asking how do all three of them manifest. Um, and here, because especially when it comes to social innovation, there is often a naive assumption that social innovation will lead to decentralization and that this is a good thing in the sense that it then will also lead to more equal power relations. So there is often that assumption about social innovation, uh, which to a certain extent you see empirically, but you also see that decentralization in one place often leads to centralization and recentralization in another place. Uh, and very good examples are of course Airbnb and Uber, where at first glance, it seems very decentralizing and disrupting towards, you know, the powers of taxi dry, uh, taxi companies and hotel chains because everybody can become a taxi driver. Everybody can rent their room. But then when you look closer, you see that there is a recentralization of power and of profits in the platform companies that are behind it. But this kind of power analysis shouldn't then make us cynical and it shouldn't stop there because the next step is then to ask, okay, so what are social innovations that are challenging these kind of power dynamics? Um, because you have a lot of initiatives that are seeing how they can use these ideas of, for instance, Airbnb, and do it in a different, more ethical and cooperative way where, you know, power relations are being challenged, such as Airbnb. And when we look at energy, the question then becomes to see how all these interesting social innovation uh, initiatives in energy, including decentralized energy production, but also the existence of the, the kind of emergence of new platforms where there is direct exchange. How, um, how is power being uh, decentralized and recentralized? And also to put it a bit more provocatively, how can we avoid that these initiatives become the Uber of the energy system? In order to study this kind of, um, these kind of questions on on how power is shifting in uh, social innovation, it's important to be very specific about who are we talking about? Who are the actors that are exercising power? Um, power relations are changing between what kind of actors and in which institutional context? Where, you know, we distinguish between public and private, formal and in, uh, non-profit and for-profit, formal and informal then distinguishing between the state, the markets, the community, the nonprofit sector, and the so-called hybrid sphere, where we very much acknowledge hybrid organizations that cross these boundaries, such as the social enterprise or a cooperative, they, they cross these institutional logics boundaries. And this is very important in social innovation because you see a lot of these hybrid organizations. And often in a lot of social innovation discourse, there is this assumption that social innovation has to come from the community or it has to come from social entrepreneurs or activists. And in the examples that I've given you, we see that that it is um, the case. But we also see that there are examples where social innovation very much emerges from within the public sector. 
such as, for instance, participatory budgeting, which, which was initiated by the mayor of, of Porto Alegre. Uh, so we emphasize that social innovation emerges across diverse institutional logics rather than associating it by definition with bottom-up or grassroots. And that the shifting relations and boundaries between these institutional logics, that in itself is a form of social innovation by definition. Um, and the fact that social innovation comes with these changing relations means that it also has all sorts of effects on existing power relations and power imbalances. Because unlike the triangle that I just showed where everything is nice and equally sized, in reality, you can argue that um, a lot of our uh, functional systems, whether it's energy, but also education, healthcare, um, water, mobility, um, agriculture, that there, there, there is a dominance of state and market logic and especially the public-private partnerships between them. And the whole community logic, which is often associated with this notion of social innovation, has been kind of suppressed and put into a corner. But then in recent years, with all this attention uh, for participation society, um, our big society, uh, and in response also to the economic crisis and austerity, suddenly there's this discourse that the community has to start doing more again. The community has to take over. But the community is kind of out of practice. And this uh, leads to a lot of interesting power dynamics because a lot of the things that at first glance are being celebrated as being uh, informal economy initiatives, as Uber and, and Airbnb initially were celebrating as, you know, the informal economy is becoming bigger and disrupting the, the formal market. But now people are arguing that in fact, Uber and Airbnb are showing that the market is becoming so big that it's even entering your bedroom. So the, when is it that the community is taking over the market or is the market starting to use community language? And so these are some of the debates that are going on. But besides these big kind of macro debates about, you know, the power dynamics between the state versus the market and how social innovation is affecting that or not, um, it's also about looking very much about at the, at the actor roles that we as individuals play across all these different logics. Where it is, especially when we're talking about social innovation initiatives, um, essential to, to uh, acknowledge that when we talk about the state, we're not just talking about politicians and bureaucrats and policymakers, but also us as citizens and voters. And when we're talking about the market, it's not just the big companies and the shells, but also the small entrepreneurs and us as, as consumers and employees. It's not just about the Greenpeace activists, but also us when we become members or give money. And in the community, we play very different roles as residents, neighbors, family members, and, and friends. Um, and here, it's then also because it's very easy to kind of judge social innovation initiatives or assess to what extent they are helping to solve this issue. Um, but when we look at individual roles that we play, we clearly see that there are also a lot of internal inconsistencies. So the way that we behave as a, as a, as a uh, citizen or a voter is not always in line with the way we behave as a consumer or, or as a parent, for instance. So all of these macro power struggles, you, you see them back at a more individual level. And in between that macro and, and more individual level, we also see the micro politics where there are fierce power struggles between national government and local government. And a lot of social innovation can ha can have to do with that, with, with that, how the relations between national and local government are changing or between politicians and civil servants. Uh, and also in the market, it's not necessarily um, about how to disrupt the power of companies, but also very much about, you know, the relation between small entrepreneurs and, and larger companies, between consumers and producers. And also in the community, of course, you have some of the fiercest power struggles between men and women, young and old, poor and rich. And, and the big challenge for social innovation research is to question how social innovations are affecting these power relations, un intendedly or unintendedly. Um, and it's, of course, very obvious to look at renewable energy and to see how it can help decentralize power from market and state towards communities. Uh, but when we look at these community energy initiatives, like a happy picture like this, it's equally important to ask who is not 
on that picture, who is being excluded, who, who cannot afford to be involved. But then again, not stop there with our power analysis, but really lo actively look for innov innovative partnerships between different actors. For instance, between um, uh, local governments and, and, and renewable energy entrepreneurs like they, they did in Spain, where you see that there is uh, new partnerships where the, the revenues of renewable energies are being reinvested to deal with energy poverty at a municipal, uh, municipality level. So not just for the individual community energy initiatives, but much wider also at a public level. So besides public private partnerships between markets and, and the state, you can also have um, public uh, private partnerships between the markets and the community. And here it's then also important to acknowledge the differences between macro level power relations and micro level power relations. Um, where we need to be careful when we assess the transformative potential of social innovation initiatives to not only assess to what extent are they really challenging, you know, neoliberalism or something, but also to look at how they are challenging power relations at a more uh, small scale. So this is an argument that we developed in this chapter on the transformative potential of social enterprise, because in the social innovation field, there is a lot of this question about social enterprise being problematic for reproducing uh, this idea of, of neoliberalism and capitalism. Uh, but in this chapter, we argue, well, maybe at the macro level, it reproduces the existing system, but you know, you cannot change the macro level at once. In the meantime, there is also a lot of power relations within the existing market and social enterprises are um, challenging that. So th this is a famous example about African clean energy where um, solar cookers are being sold uh, to people under the poverty line across Africa. And there's a lot of critique of this for, you know, uh, reproducing the idea of a consumer and it's kind of capitalistic because they make, can make a lot of profit out of this. Um, but while we, and that critique it needs to be, you know, analyzed, but at the same time, we can also acknowledge that within the current system, it is empowering people to, to be consumers as many of us are. So to be re really attentive to the difference between macro level power relations and micro level power relations and that not all initiatives uh, change all relations at all times. I look forward to discussion about this. Um, okay, to finalize, some reflections on the politics of transformative social innovation. Um, yeah, obviously, <laughs> I uh, very much plea for a politicization, politicization of uh, research on social innovation. And I mean this in two different ways. On the one hand, it's about acknowledging and analyzing the politics uh, so as in, in, an, in an analytical and theoretical sense but it's also about a certain involvement as researchers and being aware of how our research is being used and what is the, the effect of our research um, because uh, and here i don't mean getting affiliated with a particular political party i mean much more in the sense of looking at what's going on in the world, looking at the many different protests that are going on, the many different uh, tensions, and relate our research to that. Uh, we're currently at a very political moment where we see the rise of authoritarian and xenophobic uh, politics, uh, where we see increasing divides and tensions between generations, between social economic classes, between ethnicities, and these divides are being fueled further through certain political discourses. So I think it's more now more important than ever to really show how intertwined and interconnected the ecological and the social economic um, aspects are. And I think this is something that is really also our responsibility as researchers. So then a big question is why then focus on social innovation? Because in a way it's, you know, very focused, you know, in transition field, we look at social technical and we say that everything is connected. So why then focus on social innovation? It's a question that I keep asking myself. I get asked that question also a lot. Um, so first of all, uh, compared to looking at social technical innovation, I think the use of focusing on social innovation, I'm not saying everybody should, I'm just saying that there is a legitimacy for some of us to focus on that is that it recognizes the social as an object of innovation in itself, rather than the social being just a dimension of technological innovation. 
So that's one. Second, because when I then, uh, in the context of social movement research, the question is why innovation? You know, why do you call it innovation? Why not just call it, you know, a movement or an alternative or, you know, an initiative? Why do you need the word innovation? And here I think it's um, the contribution of innovation is to really um, recognize that there's this kind of new wave of social movements, what Lara Monticelli has called prefigurative social movements. These are movements that are not just protesting against, you know, the problems and what they don't like, but really focusing on prefiguring, on creating uh, a new, new futures. So I think innovation has a very important role in understanding uh, these prefigurative social movements. Um, and last but not least, uh, I think innovation is a very important uh, type of power. Uh, it's an important source of power. Uh, so it's not only that we need to understand power in order to start to understand innovation, but to my fellow power researchers, I tell them, in order to understand how power relations are being changed and reproduced, we also need to start innovation. So uh, understand innovation. So innovation um, becomes an important and social innovation in particular about changing social relations is necessary to understand how power relations are changed and how they are reproduced. Uh, so, in, uh, to conclude with uh, the Manifesto for Transformative Social Innovation, where we um, invited representatives of the 20 social movements that we uh, studied to come together and to, you know, there's many differences across these different movements, but what, what are some of the similarities and what are some of the insights? And we developed 13 principles. I don't have time to go into all of them. Um, but just to give you one example that one important one, number um, seven, is social innovation should never be an excuse to dismantle necessary public services, which sometimes happens in social innovation discourse. Um, and I think one of the most important um, uh, plea within that manifesto was this call for more translocal and intersectional solidarity. Um, uh, not only translocal empowerment between different nations and regions between local and global, between urban and rural, but also between different issues. So more recognition and more strategic collaboration across these networks and movements. Um, and this is a big challenge. We are seeing that there are a lot of efforts to have meta networks of meta networks, um, but there is sometimes a lot of competition amongst these different networks, uh, which on the one hand is, is fuels innovation, but that some, sometimes can also be problematic for, for strategic collaboration in terms of developing countervailing power. Um, the other insight from the manifesto that I would like to end with is this uh, notion of paradox. And this was the, the final principle of the manifesto and also one of the main conclusions from the transit project was to really acknowledge that when you look at social innovation and actually at innovation more generally, in order for this to have transformative impact, it needs to be disseminated, mainstreamed, uh, scaled, whatever word you want to use, by definition, because otherwise it cannot be transformative. Uh, and in that process of mainstreaming, there is a tendency for the innovation to, to lose its innovative characteristic and to actually become the opposite of what was originally intended, like, you know, the organic agriculture becoming like paprika, really expensive paprikas, uh, packaged um, singularly with plastic in, in the supermarkets, for instance. Uh, so this paradox of innovation, where uh, it can become the opposite, that, that's very inherent to innovation and transformative change. Um, and it, we argue that it should be a starting point of our research, so we shouldn't be surprised by this paradox, but it should be our starting point. And often we think of this mainstreaming paradox and dilemma mostly in terms of, you know, how things become commercialized and marketized and commodified. But there is, of course, also all these other processes of bureaucratization and standardization and something that we often forget. Also, socialization and communalization is also a form of mainstreaming. And none of these processes of mainstreaming are innocent when it comes to power relations. So all of these processes come with empowerment, but also with disempowerment and with new uh, power inequalities. Um, so the main message also from the manifesto and, and uh, something to, to, that we want to develop further is this idea that successful innovations in the sense of being transformative are those that 
manage to translate to the mainstream context while at the same time still nurturing that radical core of what or what Bonopel has called the Trojan horse tactic. So being prepared for the dialectics of innovation capture, but at the same time also develop a flexible repertoire of, of diverse actions. So the research question that I'm currently working on in, uh, and, and hope to continue working on in the future is how do social innovations, um, how are social innovations mainstreamed? Uh, how do they gain power while maintaining their transformative potential? And here then also, you know, so how do you take this flame? And if you start, you know, expanding it, how, how do you still keep it going? And, you know, a lot of it is quite theoretical. So the aim of the, the future research is to really empirically look at how, to what extent do people, do people working on social innovation really have explicit strategies for that and how are they using it? And the other question is how, what is the countervailing power of social innovation initiatives and networks and how can it be increased? Uh, because it's all very nice that these initiatives are empowered, but to what extent are they countervailing and challenging the power of, of, of existing systems or regimes that we as we call it in transition theory so this is a question one of the questions in the social innovation and energy transition where uh, one of the things that we will do uh, in the coming months uh, and this will take place next year uh, so i'm also very eager to learn from anyone who has experience with this is to organize power labs where we really put people together from the energy system from many different institutional contexts and many different kinds of innovations and, and take power really as a starting point for discussion. You know, how is power being exercised? How, how is power being challenged? And then to conclude, um, I think if there is one thing that the corona, thing, uh, corona pandemic has shown us is that it's a crisis brings out the best in people, but it definitely also brings out the worst in people. And I think the same applies to innovation and to power. So it brings out the best in people to you know creatively come up with new ways and be empowered and empower each other but it also brings out some of the most uh, ugly sides uh, of humanity and with that i would like to thank you for your attention <laughs>